As each of us progress through life, gathering experience and perspective, we seldom have the opportunity to recount our personal stories and impart the knowledge we've gained. Walking among us, one and all, are living legacies. This is the second part of a two-part uh, interview with Mr. Paul Tanner of Carlsbad, who uh, was in the Glenn Miller Orchestra, was one of the original members, played trombone, and we're continuing our conversation. Paul, uh, welcome back. Thank you. We, uh, now we, when we left off the last show, uh, Glenn Miller had entered the service and was uh, uh, head of the Army Air Corps uh, band, and you were elsewhere in the Army. I was in New York City. And you were in New York City. Uh, what happened to Miller? He, he, he wanted to take the band, that big band, uh -huh. from England on over to Paris because uh -huh. he, he, he wanted to entertain the guys who were uh, in danger over there, you mm -hmm. know, our guys. Yeah. This is after we had liberated Paris. That's all right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so he... Uh, the Germans also liked his music, though, I understand. Yes, they did. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so he uh, he's a very impatient man. So, so he, he wanted to, to uh, fly on over and, and uh, bring the band over to Paris. Kind of a, doing an advanced trip. Yeah, to, just to set up places for them to, to play and, and to stay. Mm -hmm. You know, so he he, uh, he waited out two or three days of, of bad weather, mm -hmm. and then uh, he was offered to. to uh, uh, hop on a plane to, to go on over on a certain day and he took it and it was a small plane uh, lacking equipment mm -hmm. and uh, very bad weather mm -hmm. but but they took off uh, from England and the um, there was a, a group of, of uh, planes coming back from an aborted mission bombing mission yeah. that's right and th they had to drop their bombs in the in the channel, uh, they couldn't land with them on the plane, mm -hmm. and so they, uh, uh, there was an area they were supposed to drop them. Now, Glenn's plane happened to go off from this particular spot right into that area, and it was an unfortunate thing. They didn't have um, a flight plan, I think, because it was a, really a spur-of-the-moment thing, mm -hmm. and so they didn't have a flight plan. And so they took on off, and sure enough, the, uh, these fellows had to drop their bombs. Now, n no one thinks that Glenn's plane was hit by a bomb, but it's a very small plane flying close to the water, and so a, a, a bomb in, in the water, the, the plane would go down immediately. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, they've tried very hard to find out exactly where and everything, and so far they haven't had any luck with it. Yeah. Well, there's been... There's been many theories about what happened to Glenn Miller, but that seems to be the most accepted. It, it is the most accepted one, and, and that's what I believe. That's what Glenn's son, Steve, believes. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. um, it, it certainly is a... Uh, it, 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 it makes you very suspicious of all these uh, strange stories that come up yeah. about Glenn. Now, his two, uh, two children are still living, Steve, and, and what's the daughter's name? Johnny D. And she lives in La Jolla? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the war is over. Did, did, there was an attempt to reorganize the band under, uh, was it Tex, Tex Beneke or Ray McKinley? Who did the, who did the reorganizing? Well, uh, the, M McKinley started having a band, but it really wasn't a Glenn Miller type setup. So the guy that like Glenn had had, had hoped would have a band and he would back him mm -hmm. was Tex Beneke. Mm -hmm. So Tex started a band. Uh, the Glenn Miller office handled him and so forth. Mm -hmm. you know, And he started him about. Did you play with him? Sure did, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the office held me to my contract. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have done it anyway. They held me to a contract to play for, for one year and I stayed with him six years. That was the year that Glenn asked you to, to but you were going to play for a year after. Yeah, yeah. So you, you played for six years with the... With Tex. Yeah. With Tex, yeah. yeah we, were, we were 
very good buddies. Uh, Tex was a charmer. I was going to say he always had a had a sparkling personality. You know? oh, he was a nice fellow. Yeah. Nice yeah, yeah. Was, was the band as good with uh, with Tex as it was with uh, Glenn? Well, there was only one Glenn, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, Tex, being exactly what he was, uh, was not a Glenn Miller um, musically. The, what? What was Glenn's secret? Did it, it was his preciseness and keeping the band tight, uh, keeping everybody uh, on their toes. Uh, what, well, what, what? you know, if you're a, you're a brass player, you know, you, you you play a brass instrument. If you're a brass player, you can miss a note. Mm -hmm. And, that was and I've done that several times. Have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you came in wrong, then that was carelessness. Yeah. And he wouldn't stand for that. Yeah. 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 So uh, after six years, what did uh, Paul Tanner do? Uh, I uh, quit and went with the, uh, I was on the network with the ABC, American Broadcasting Company, mm -hmm. and I was there for 17 years. With a studio band or? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a house band. Of course, they didn't use me a lot, they had to pay me, but they didn't use me a lot, which meant I had a, a lot of time on your hands. Huh? Well, I had time to to do a lot of freelancing, yeah, yeah. which was very nice. And so one of the things I did is I enrolled in UCLA as a freshman. Uh -huh. I was the oldest freshman in captivity. <laughs> yeah. How old were you at that time? Oh, I must have been well into my 30s. Yeah, taking advantage of the GI Bill. Huh? That's exactly right. Yeah. <clears throat> That's the reason I, I, finally let, uh, I finally left Tex, because I had to in order to get in on the GI Bill. and. Uh, because I was on the staff, uh, I, I had the, uh, conflictions that were unbelievable, yeah. and I had to drop out of school for about three years. Yeah. And then when uh, that situation was solved, I, I uh, went back in, and I stayed there until I graduated. Before we leave Glenn Miller uh, and move on, um, I think it's important to point out just how powerful his presence on the American music scene was, uh, I think he had 72 top 10 hits at one time, I mean overall, but it, uh, in one year 44 of, of his hits were in, were in the top 10. Is, yes, is that, the, one of the main ways they had of checking it out was, was what, came, what came out over the air and what the nickels asked were in the jukeboxes. Yeah, that's something that the, uh, kids today don't they don't understand about what a jukebox was. I mean, that that was a big uh, industry. Boy, it really was, yeah. And so uh, Glenn did very well on the jukeboxes. Uh, he, he got a a nickel for every three nickels that went in. Is that right? Yeah. Now, what uh, if you don't mind me asking, what kind of what kind of money were you making with the Glenn Miller Orchestra? We each had our own minimum. But uh, the minimum, Glenn was doing so well that, that the minimums never came into play. Yeah. So you'd uh, you end up being union scale, or here's your minimum here. Yeah. Union scale is according to what you do. At one time we were working the uh, Hotel Pennsylvania and the Paramount Theater at the same time, uh -huh. and three Chesterfield programs for the East Coast and three for the West Coast and an occasional record date, all at the same time. Uh -huh. Now the union saw to it that you're compensated for taking your horn out of the case. Yeah. So uh, uh, our, our salaries wouldn't um, amount to anything at all. Mm -hmm. You did a lot, of, a lot of radio work. Absolutely. In fact, I did a lot of, of, of radio work for, for Glenn, and I did a lot of uh, radio work for the network I was, mm -hmm. I was under contract to. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's a lot of recordings, mm -hmm. you know, where uh, guys like, like Nelson Riddle. Well, I, I used to play with Charlie Spivak, and Nelson Riddle was fourth trombone. So we, we, we were good buddies. Yeah. So he came out here, and he was doing well, and so he would use me. Yeah. Billy May was doing very well, and we, we were good buddies from the Miller Band. So he would use me, yeah. and it goes on and on and on like that. Yeah. So I, yeah. I was doing a lot of freelance. Of course, Glenn and, and uh, all of the, the the 
band leaders in those days were like rock stars are today. I mean, they were the, they were real personalities, and they were the ones that got the good deals. Uh, uh, you guys just got a, a side man. You just you just got a salary. You didn't get any. Uh, you're not getting any uh, 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 royalties out of out of any of those recordings. No, it's a nice thought there, Tom. <laughs> you know, we were paid to, 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 to make the records. Sure. I've never objected to, to the fact that the leader made so much money. Because yeah. He's the guy who takes a chance. You go in and you play a record date if nothing happens to the record. Mm -hmm. And with the Miller Band, uh, we made something like oh, 171 records or 271 or something, uh, recordings. He's the one that took a chance. We had to be paid. Yeah. And if nothing happened to a record, we still got paid. You still got so paid. So I, I've never objected to yeah. a leader making the profit. Well, that's that's a good attitude to have. About it. What? Well, let's get you back in college. You're going to you're going to UCLA. That's right. And the oldest freshman on, probably in the country. And uh, they would call call roll time. And Sam, Bill, Frank, Mr. Tanner, Jim. <laughs> No, you were studying music. Well, I had a lot of holes in my music knowledge. That uh, place I, like I could fill those holes up. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it worked out very well for me. So you probably didn't. Ma you probably didn't let too many people know that you you you, you learned a lot of tricks from uh, reform schools <laughs> students. <laughs> no, that's too far behind. Yeah, but they. Uh, uh, so as soon as I graduated, they, uh, they put me on the faculty. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, now you ended up with a doctorate, didn't you? And, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. uh, and you taught for 23 years at the UCLA? At UCLA, right. Well, you had some pretty uh, interesting experiences as a teacher. Uh, you had one of the more popular courses? Uh, or I, I taught in the history of jazz. I had 75,000 students went, went through that. 75,000. Yeah, not in one day. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About 500 at a time. 550. That's how, how many seats the auditorium had. Uh huh. <laughs> you have 550 people in there. The, the fire department would would uh, bolt, bolt the door. That's all they could come in. Now, would they uh, would the students have to wait a few semesters before they could get into your course? Very often, yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Now you. You'd have guest speakers from time to time that, that were kind of interesting. Uh, people would, would would call me on the phone and they'd say, "We, uh, you know, we'd like to come down to your class." And the thing it meant to them was as a, as a whole auditorium full of people who were very interested in what they did. So therefore, entertainers liked that kind of an audience. Who who were some of the people that would call you up? Well, I, I mentioned to you before, like Stan Kenton would, would, would call up. And say, I haven't been out of your class in a little while. I said, good, when do you want to come down? He say, tomorrow. <laughs> and that, that's fine. <laughs> all, all, all kinds of uh, instrumentalists and groups and so forth would want to come in and perform with them because they, they'd be appreciated. Uh-huh, yeah. A lot yeah. of fun for them. Well, and of course, th th that's a potential uh, customer for a, a record sale. 550 at a time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah, it was f free publicity for them. Yeah. A and you had a nice, easy day of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind of mess. It kind of played havoc with your lesson guide, though, didn't it? Uh, I was never really glued into that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you mentioned you you knew Billy May and uh, worked with Billy May. And Billy May was a was one of the original uh, players in the Glen Miller Orchestra, wasn't he? Yeah. Played trumpet. Trumpet and a very good arranger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt about when you hear a Billy May uh, record or an orchestra or an arrangement, you know exactly who it is. I mean, he had that. Well, he could surprise you, Tom. For example, if, if you know the introduction to uh, uh, Serenade in Blue, mm -hmm. Glenn wanted a very much of a classical type introduction. Now, he had a good staff there. He had Billy, he had uh, Bill Finnegan, he had Jerry Gray. And they each tried to write an introduction that was satisfying, and it didn't. So what does he do? He turns to a jazz trumpet player, Billy May, and says, can you write an introduction for it? I said, sure. And he did, and it's a gorgeous thing. comes out unbelievably classical. And, and Glenn said, that's what I wanted. 
I, I called Billy on the phone. I said, how'd you come up with that? And he said, it's amazing what you learn listening to, to classical records. You know, uh, people probably don't know, but Billy May lived in San Juan Capistrano and up until he died. And when I uh, was putting together the uh, Gershwin Festival, I called him up and asked him if he'd come down. And he, was very, he was very gracious. He said, uh, well, Tom, he says, you know, at 84, I don't have to do things like that anymore. So thank you very much, but no thanks. <laughs> yeah. and, and very blunt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he lets you know exactly where he stood on that. But, uh, he, he probably added a couple four-letter jobs. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, we're on television. I guess. Oh. <laughs> but yes, he was. Uh, he was a good guy. Yeah, yeah. very funny. Yeah. Um, some of the other uh, uh, big names that uh, that come to mind uh, that uh, over the years. Uh, Benny Goodman, G uh, Gene Krupa, Harry James. Uh, did you know any of these fellows, or did they sit in on any of your classes? Or Glenn took sick once in uh, New York and had to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So he sent subs to lead the, the band. Uh -huh. And who does he send? Tommy Dorsey. He sends Gene Krupa <laughs> and people like, like that to sub for him uh, on the stage of the Paramount. Uh -huh. And so, he, and actually, you, uh, they sat in, they played, and you, you can see Tommy Dorsey playing those low A flats on In the Mood or something, you know. But uh, uh, he, uh, you, you got to where you knew some of them, mm -hmm. some of them as leaders, some of them just as side men. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, there was uh, there were some great musicians in those days. Uh, now. Tell me about your family. What do uh, you have children? Um, this, this beautiful lady that I'm married to mm -hmm. has a couple of, of grown sons, mm -hmm. and that's the extent. Mm -hmm. And they're charmers. They're really, really nice guys. Now, you you taught at, uh, at UCLA for 23 years. What year did you uh, What year did you hang it up? What year did you retire? Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't can't put a year on it. Now you've been you've been here in the North County for how many years? I, I think that's about seventy seven or seventy eight. I, mm -hmm. I think over there, but my wife is in the dark, and, and <laughs> she's the one that answers things for me. Yeah, you know. But uh, we, we have we have a nice life, you know. We, we we've done seventy cruises. Well, you're getting ready to do another one. Oh yeah. Now this is the one that I wanted to go on, but just the time he's on, right? But you're go, you're going to celebrate your 90th birthday with friends. We're going to get on a cruise ship in San Diego, uh, cruise to Hawaii, and come back to San Diego. And they're they're celebrating my uh, 90th birthday. Isn't that something? Well, I was going to say, it, it's to me, it's it's the dream vacation because you don't have to travel very far to get on the boat. No. You should go with us, Tom. Well, I wanted to go. I wanted to go. Uh, uh, be a lot of fun. Now, you've written some books. Tell me about them. Well, while I was at UCLA, I, I wrote a good 30 or so books, or technical things. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <clears throat> um, a, a lot on how to play and some on... Uh, how to listen to jazz and things like that. Uh, but then now I've written uh, three or four books on uh, on being with Glenn Miller, mm -hmm. and th th they're just fun things. Uh, are they are they well received? Yeah, they're they're fine. Sometimes they're hard to find, uh, but I write like I talk, uh -huh. and so they're easy reading. Uh -huh. You know. Did you ever meet uh, Sammy Nestico? Yeah, we're good friends. Now, there's a guy that uh, I think could could uh, write one heck of a, a, a book from a, from a, a personal standpoint uh, with all these years that he spent not only with the military bands but with uh, Count Basie as his arranger. Yeah. And he lives in Carlsbad as well. Yeah. We, we were doing a show for somebody. He, he was doing some arranging. Uh-huh. And uh, I forget who the leader was. Very busy fellow, conducting a lot of different shows. <clears throat> and the guy looks around, 
and his French horn player hadn't shown up. And he had a lot of things for the French horn player to do, you know, and he hadn't shown up. And in comes Sammy. So I said, Sammy, you, you got a trombone with you? He said, yeah. I said, you play the trombone part, I'll go back and play the French horn part. And so I, 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 put, I put a felt over the horn, no verbata, and played the French horn parts on, on the whole show. And the guy was so grateful I had saved him a pot full of money yeah. that day that uh, he kept me very busy. Well, well, Sammy uh, has one of the one of the one of the most popular uh, arranging books. I think college students all over the world uh, use that book, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think yeah, that's what he told he's, me. He's a very talented fellow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A nice guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're so blessed to have not only guys like yourself living in the area, but a, a lot of other great musicians and and uh, uh, people that have just been into the into the big band era from the, you know from the 30s on on uh, through the well Tom the surprising thing is there are more and more young people now that are starting to be uh, uh, accepted of this kind of music you know do you think that it's going to have a resurgence to a degree well it always has gone in circles you know and so uh, I, I get a feeling that they're quite popular you look out there now quite a few young people dancing well, we had a we had a big band bash uh, out at the Pier Amphitheater last September. We had three bands, my band and really? the big band and Jazz Hall of Fame Orchestra and then Jay, Jay Wimmer's all, all Stars. And we just we did nonstop music from noon to 7 uh, p.m. And uh, we had a bunch of uh, young people from Orange County come down, swing dancers, you know, their clubs. and. They started dancing at noon, and they were still. When we quit playing at seven o'clock, they were, they were still dancing. Well, seven o'clock is early in the morning. <laughs> no, this was from seven from noon to seven p.m. at night. We did we did a. At seven p.m. was early in the morning. If you're out there playing at your regular nine to. 1. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just would hope that uh, that it does it does. Uh, keep going because one of the big problems of course is is money people uh, promoters don't want to pay the money that it costs to put a, a big band on a stage you know yeah that's right even if it's not even if it's not uh, union scale it's still expensive you know yeah well what's we're about ready to run out of time but other than the cruise what's next for Paul Tanner my wife and I are, are trying to, to retire <laughs> you know, uh, musicians don't ever retire. Come on. <laughs> no, they just get tired. Huh? <laughs> Do you play any more at all? No, I, I don't have a horn even. Uh, the Japanese fellow who published these these books mm -hmm. uh, bought my horn from me, and he has it on on the wall in his office in in Tokyo. So I'm up there with a moose head and so forth. <laughs> Well, I was hoping you'd maybe have given it to the uh, Museum of Making Music in Carlsbad, but uh, that was the only one you had, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Paul, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed try. this last hour. I will try. You did a wonderful job. I am so honored to uh, to have been able to sit down and talk with you. I've known you for several years. We've met a few times. and. Uh, I hope that uh, this next September you, we'll see you out at the Big Band Bash by the beach. That'd and be a lot of fun. I'll give you a call and uh, remind you about it. Good. We've been talking with Mr. Paul Tanner, one of the original members of the Glenn Miller Orchestra. Paul is a Carlsbad resident, taught for 23 years at UCLA, and has a doctorate degree in music. And it's been my pleasure to interview him here on Living Legacies. Join us again here next time on KOCT's Living Legacies.